is this place? Where is everyone? Hey folks, and welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. September's featured free marketplace content is here. Whether you want to create futuristic neon cityscapes, cool countrysides, animate complex fighting styles, or reach for the sky with interior arcviz props, we've got you covered. If you're making an anime-inspired project or fantasy game, you now have all the buildings, props, trees, and water meshes you need to set the scene with Stylized Asian Village, now a part of our permanently free content. We've already seen how developers are turning to real-time technology to sell new build homes and build next-gen sales suites to showcase luxury developments. Now dive into how developers are using Unreal Engine's real-time technology to convey their vision for the pre-concept phase of urban master planning, enabling them to secure investments and planning permission. Learn more at unrealengine.com feed. While there, take a look inside the development of Unreal Engine 5's first big MOBA. Learn more about how Paragon and other MOBAs played a critical role in guiding the development of the project and how receiving an epic mega grant opened more doors for Amida Studios to power the development of its cross-platform, third-person, multiplayer online battle arena predecessor. 
Heading on over to this week's Community Spotlights, if you love stylized fantasy environments, 3D environment artist Eric Tahiri has got something to feast your eyes on. Over the past few months, they have been working on a real-time environment in Unreal Engine 4 with large vistas and gameplay-focused areas deeply inspired by the games they love for their upcoming project, Nexus A World Beyond. See the full sneak peek on their ArtStation page. Exploring high-quality real-time workflows, Jonathan Moreira created this scene using Sketchfab assets, Quixel Megascans, motion capture animations from Mixamo, and the Unreal Marketplace to develop the creative and action-packed cinematic experience further. Let them know what you think of Honor on the forums. To showcase their virtual camera and live editing capabilities with Unreal Engine, Versatile Media took the wheel and created this fantastic short. Buckle up as a chase in shoes in the post-apocalyptic vast and dusty desert in Wasteland. Swerve to their YouTube channel to watch the short in full and learn more about their versatile workflow. Thanks for watching. Catch you next week. everyone, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host, Tina, and today with me I have two absolutely incredible animators who are ready to totally blow our minds, <laughs> and I for one am excited. Uh, first off, let's start with Kieran. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, happy to be here. So my name is Kieran Ritchie. I'm an animation programmer at Epic, coming up on being here for two years. And my primary responsibility here is IK and retargeting in Unreal Engine. Um, I have a background in games and film and TV. And uh, my real passion is, uh, you know, building tools for people that uh, bring them some element of joy in their work. So my hope is that I can show you something today that gets you excited for retargeting in Unreal Engine 5. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Very much looking forward to it. And then next up we have Jose. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what we're going to be getting into today? Sure. Uh, hello, my name is Jose Villarreal. I'm an animation programmer at Epic Games. I've been here for almost three years now and I uh, work uh, in the animation gameplay team. Uh, I've worked in Fortnite and more recently in Unreal Engine 5. Uh, about me, like I uh, came from college here and before that I loved participating in the Epic Game Jams that were hosted right here. And I've been watching these live streams probably since 2014, and it's, it's it feels really cool to be in one of these now. Yep. Um, to have you here. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, let me tell you a bit about what I'll uh, will be showing here today. So today we're going to be talking about uh, Lyra, uh, which is an Unreal Engine 5 sample project that uh, sort of shows like the, the framework. Uh, it, it's, it's a framework, an example of how we build games uh, internally. So the, the features that we use and the way we use them would be very close to how we develop games internally. The goal is that people will be able to like, build their own experiences in Lyra, use it as, a, as an example to understand how different systems interact with each other. Uh, and, and also, like it's, it's a great learning resource. We've uh, documented a lot of it, and we've worked with it to make our own experiences. So. We're sort of like uh, developers and users of, of, Lyra, uh, of Lyra in that sense. Uh, but today, we'll be focusing on the animation side of things. So I'd like to give you an, an overview of what uh, Lyra looks like in case you're not really familiar with it. You could say also Lyra is available now on the uh on the Epic Game Store. So you can just go ahead and download the project with Unreal Engine 5, and uh, you can see exactly what we're doing today. Now I'd like to show a little bit of the editor, like Lyra running here. So whenever you start Lyra, this is the map that you're going to go into. So you can just straight go to press play, and you're going to see a bunch of different experiences that you can, uh, you can play in Lyra. Uh, 
Uh, the most fleshed out one at the moment is our elimination and control. So I'm going to go into elimination. And you're, you're going to see here, uh, it's a multiplayer uh, arena shooter where you can, uh, you can play, you can run around, you can shoot. There's different weapons, different characters, and pretty much anything that you'd expect from a regular arena shooter. Now, the first tip of the day is going to be probably the number one question I, I get uh, when new people are, are trying out Lyra, which is how to get the bots to not destroy you immediately. Since I'm really bad at the game, uh, you'll want to go straight to editor preferences. I think Karen I just asked about this one recently. Uh, it's yesterday. Want, yeah. You want to go to developer settings, and you have this option right here that's going to be enabled. Uh, they can no longer attack you once you do that. And if you want no bots because you're testing something else, you just set it to zero bots. Uh, in, uh, in Lyra, we also have the uh, accompanying uh, documentation on the Unreal Engine website. Uh, you're going to see right here uh, where we go uh, pretty deep into how we use the animation systems in Lyra and with links of all the new features that you're going to see in Unreal, in, in Unreal Engine. So, uh, the goal with, uh, with the animation systems here is to sort of like keep uh, assets separated in a way that's understandable to you, that's flexible to add new weapons, and that it's also uh, flexible to add maybe like uh, animations from, for new movement styles, new abilities and such. And we also wanted this to be the kind of project that you can bring your own projects into. And that's something Karen is going to go into today. Yeah, I'll pass it off to you now. Uh, cool. Can I can we show my screen? Okay. So as Jose alluded to, the idea behind Lyra is that uh, you you know use it as a starting place for your own project, and that of course entails modifying the characters. Um, so by default, it comes with our new UE five mannequins. We call them Manny and Quinn. The uh, the masculine and feminine versions of our new mannequin. And these guys have kind of our new standardized skeletal format, which differs slightly from the UE4 mannequin that you're probably familiar with. Um, and there's some things you have to be aware of when swapping animations that are intended for the UE5 mannequin onto a different skeletal mesh. Uh, by default, you know, depending on the type of skeleton that you're bringing in, the animation may or may not be compatible. And so what I'm going to show you here today is the suite of tools that comes with Unreal Engine 5 for retargeting. Uh, so the outline here um, will we'll cover what is retargeting exactly so that you understand you know, what it is that, that we're, we're looking at. Uh, we'll understand what all our options are for retargeting animation in Unreal Engine 5. We'll take a look at uh, then we'll deep dive into some of those options. So there's simple retargeting, or also known as translation retargeting. We'll understand how that works. We'll look at the more advanced uh, IK retargeting, and we'll understand how that works. And then we'll go through and actually set up an IK retarget. And at the end, we'll do a live demo where we'll take a random skeletal mesh off the Unreal Marketplace, rig it up with an IK retarget, and put it in Lyra. So you can see exactly step by step how we actually take the character in Lyra that we provide and allow you to swap in any skeletal mesh off the store. OK, so let's get started. Uh, what is animation retargeting? As I alluded to, it's the process of transferring animation between different skeletons. So you bring in your skeletal mesh from your own production or somewhere on the marketplace, anywhere out in the wild, really, it doesn't matter. Um, unless that skeleton is identical uh, in terms of well, we'll talk about it later, but unless it's unless it's pretty much identical to the source animation that we're uh, copying from, you do need to do some kind of, of retargeting. And the, the degree of difference between your skeletons will determine what type of retargeting to apply. So what are the ways in which uh, I'm getting some uh, audio feedback? <laughs> it's weird. Um, so what are the ways in which skeletons can vary? Um, short answer is there's lots of ways. The long answer, I've listed them here. So, you know, you have the names of the bones in your skeleton, how they're oriented. In other words, uh, this is something that kind of confuses people, but think about like your elbow. So your elbow can only really bend in one degree of freedom. And that could, the, 
the axis that the rigor chooses to assign to that degree of freedom is somewhat arbitrary. Like it could be the X, Y, or Z axis that causes it to bend in the direction that it's supposed to. If the target skeleton that you're playing your animation back on is different, maybe that X rotation is now a Y rotation and your elbow's bending, you know, up in the wrong direction, you're breaking elbows. So they can, you know, you have to make sure your orientations are correct. The reference pose uh, has to be identical between your source and your target. So that's the, the pose that defines uh, basically where there's zero rotation been applied to your skeleton. And that's often either a T pose or more often in, in the case of Unreal, an A pose where the character is standing there with their arms kind of at 45 degrees looking like the letter A. Um, then you have your parent-child relationships or your hierarchy. So this is how the bones are parented to each other. Are your shoulders parented to a clavicle? Is the clavicle parented to the top spine bone or maybe the mid spine bone? Or is there an extra bone in between? You know, like those kinds of things. Um, the proportions of the character matter a lot. Are, are, does, do you have long chimpanzee arms, short little dwarf arms? Like uh, The proportions will determine how the animation looks when you're transferring. Um, the scale of the character, are we transferring animation from a tiny little character onto a massive giant or vice versa? The number of bones, the, even the number of limbs. So all these things can vary and they can all determine your the right approach. And my hope here is that I can actually like give you a bit of wisdom because this stuff gets really complicated. And it's, it's it wasn't clear to me when I started using <coughs> Unreal what the options even were, much less which one to choose and how to make that decision. It's kind of complicated, unfortunately. Um, there are good reasons for why things are complicated in this manner. There's a lot of performance considerations and complexity considerations to make. So um, I'm hoping by the end of this little presentation here, everyone who has these questions will kind of uh, understand you know, what, what decisions to make. <sighs> okay, so uh, depending on the discrepancies between your source and target skeleton, you have these basic options here. So you can do no retargeting if they're identical, and that is the ideal. You should always, if you have the ability, try not to do what I'm going to teach you to do today. So um, in the perfect world, your skeletons are identical. You don't worry, you don't think about retargeting, and you go on your merry way. If that might entail, you know, even going back into your into your uh, DCC application, Maya, Blender, what have you, making modifications to your skeleton to make that happen. If you can do that, if that's an option for you, do it because retargeting, you know, is it requires a bit of expertise. It, it requires some extra computation, um, so avoiding it is the best case scenario. But of course, you know, characters are not all identical lockstep, you know, uh, carbon copies of each other in in most productions. So some amount of retargeting is inevitable. Um, for the next case, we have simple translation retargeting. We'll talk about that more. There's copy pose from mesh. Um, there's the compatible skeletons, which is new in Unreal Engine 5, and IK retargeting, which is also new in Unreal Engine 5. So we'll, we'll go through each one and help you understand which one to choose and when. So the first scenario, you have your source and your target skeleton on the exact same skeleton asset. They have the exact same reference pose, and they have the exact same proportions. Um, right on. You don't need to use retargeting. This is this is a scenario where you can just play sequences and they're going to just work, quote unquote. Um, so how does that work? Well, the bone transforms stored in the animation sequence are decompressed and applied directly to your skeleton based on the names. And because we've guaranteed that all the orientations and bones and everything are identical, it's going to play back just fine for you. So that's that's the ideal scenario. Now we're going to get things where things get a little bit kind of dicey. Um, in this scenario. You have the same, your source and target are on the same skeleton asset. They have the same reference pose, but they have different proportions. So you might have a lineup of characters in your game from like short, medium to tall, maybe with different uh, varying hip widths and shoulder widths. And in this case, you need what we call translation or simple retargeting. This is very common. This is uh, what you see all the time in games like Fortnite, where um, you know multiple characters are sharing the same animation set despite having different lengths of legs and arms and so on. And uh, you do need to set up the translation retargeting options correctly to, uh, to make this work. If you don't, you will very quickly notice that when you play an animation on a character with different proportions than what it was authored on, you will get uh, either floating feet or, or feet that are below the ground. So if the, hips, if the hip height in the source animation is here and the hip height in the target skeletal mesh is here, that delta will not be maintained and the character will basically just you know move down or up depending on on the scenario um, so to fix this you need to get into your into your skeleton asset and 
you'll find these hidden translation retargeting options. So it, there's this drop down menu here in the skeleton tree which hides these. So you have to turn that on. And then you'll get this option, which is per bone. And you're telling each bone how it should, how it should transfer the animation from the source skeleton to the target um, in, in terms of just the translation. So this doesn't make any modifications to the rotation values. It's just the translation, which holds the proportional difference. So if you think about like a character with really long legs, the, the knee bone is going to be translated further. And so if we just copy that translation value from the source directly, it's not going to put it, it's going to stretch or squash the, that, that bone, right? And we don't want that. Um, more often than not, what you want to do here is take your pelvis bone and set it to animation scaled or animation relative. And that will compensate so that you can play the same animations on your short and tall characters, no problem. Um, so yeah, that's your, your most common scenario. Now we're going to get into things that are a little bit more crazy. So in this third scenario, we have the same hierarchy, same reference pose, but they're on a different skeleton asset and with possibly extra bones. Um, this is also a very common scenario that we have on Fortnite and many Unreal productions deal with this. Um, and your options here are twofold. So you, you can do a copy pose from mesh or you can use compatible skeletons, which is a new feature in Unreal 5. Um, so I wanna talk about this extra bones part. This is super common where you have um, maybe identical or characters that only differ in proportion, like what I was just discussing, but they also have some additional thing on them. Like it could be a backpack or a ponytail or some kind of accessory that requires extra bones. Now, if you import that onto the same skeleton, those extra ponytail or backpack bones will get globbed into the skeleton asset itself. And so you can imagine that that's not a very scalable solution because over time, your skeleton asset is just going to grow and grow and grow and it never gets smaller because it's going to have like every ponytail, every backpack, every, um, you know, accessory that you've ever added to your game is just going to keep getting globbed into there. And, and it gets really unwieldy um, and it's just not a scalable solution. So what we recommend then is, is using something called copy pose for mesh. And so... Uh, the way that works is you import your skeletal mesh, say your backpack or your, your character with a ponytail, but you, you import it on its own unique skeleton asset. So all those unique bones go into a different skeleton asset. Now, the problem there, of course, is you can't now share animations because they're on different, a different skeleton asset. So we provide this solution called Copy Pose for Mesh. I think I have a picture of it here. So we'll go into details on that. So the way this works is... You run two, um, two skeletal mesh components in your actor blueprint. The source skeletal mesh is running your normal base layer of animation. So that includes your run, walk, jump, all that kind of stuff. Your second skeletal mesh is parented underneath it, and that contains just the extra accessories. So you split those off from the main character, like their ponytail, backpack, or whatever. You put it on a separate skeletal mesh that's parented underneath the, the source, and then you create a custom animation blueprint just for your backpack or just for your ponytail. And you put in that animation blueprint a copy pose for mesh node with the reference to the source mesh component to copy from. So it'll, it'll go there, it'll copy all the bones that are common between your backpack and your base character so that your backpack is in the right pose. So you can imagine uh, for this to work, you actually have to have in your backpack or in, in your accessory um, all the bones going up from where, where it attaches. In the case of a backpack, it would attach its spine too. So you need to have all the way from root, pelvis, spine one, spine two, spine three, all the way up to the bone where your backpack attaches have to be in there and identical. And then the copy pose for mesh is going to copy all those similar bones, all those bones that are common between your source and your target so that your backpack ends up in the right place. Like if the character's bent over, you need the backpack to stick there, right? So that, that entire pose gets copied over verbatim. And then after the copy post from mesh node, what's kind of cool is your backpack is now attached to the, to the base uh, skeleton. It's moving along with the skeleton. So as the character moves, the backpack comes along. But you also have the ability now to add custom animation to it. So if you want to add floppy things like you see in Fortnite skins um, or, or even like a custom animation sequence that loops on the backpack, maybe, you know, they, like there's a for, there's a skin in Fortnite with a dog in the backpack, so you can just like it can, it can become essentially its its own entire character, right? And you have your own animation blueprints. So you can customize the heck out of it. This is extremely powerful, and I want to make sure that people understand that um, copy pose from mesh is your ticket out of the mess that is putting everything on one skeleton. So this is how you make like 
this is like the foundation of modular characters. There's a lot more to it, but um, you know, hopefully everyone's aware of that now. Uh, parallel to that and similar, there's also compatible skeletons. So this is a new feature in Unreal Engine 5, and I think it's important that people, first of all, know that it's there and understand what the intention was behind it. So the way compatible skeletons work is, much like copy pose from Mesh, you have an identical uh, skeleton, but possibly with extra bones on it, and it's on a different skeleton asset. So, um, but you just want to play, you want to be able to, it, it's a different skeleton asset, but with identical bones and, and hierarchy, right? So you, you just want to be able to share animations between them. You want, to just, you want to just tell Unreal, hey, I know these aren't the same skeleton asset, but they're actually the same skeleton. So just treat them like they're the same, right? And so you, now, you, you can do that now in Unreal Engine 5. In the skeleton asset editor, you go under window. It's a little bit hidden, but you go under window to asset details, and you'll bring up this little tab here with this array called compatible skeletons, and you can add uh, references to other skeletons in there. So you can take your, your base skeleton and say, hey, you know, um, this other variant is compatible with you, and then that variant can play um, any of the sequences that that base skeleton has. You can uh, share animation blueprints with that base skeleton, and it basically treats it as though they're sharing the same skeleton, but without all the cruft that comes from actually sharing the same skeleton asset. <laughs> Terminology is failing me here. I'm saying I'm going to say skeleton about 400 times before we're through this. But... Okay, so that's uh, compatible skeletons and copy pose, and now we're going to get into the the wacky, crazy last scenario. So this is like. Your hierarchy is different. Your reference pose is different. There are different skeleton assets. There's missing bones. There's extra bones. It's a completely different character, right? So there's no hope of like getting these things aligned in any kind of way. And and really, what this is about is getting more reuse out of your assets. So if you have a walk cycle, for example, that's been authored on a fox, and you have maybe an alien that looks kind of dog-like, but they have maybe you know some extra bones in their leg and their spine is made of six bones instead of four, you know, just they're, they're structurally similar enough that you think the animation could conceivably carry over, but the skeletons are completely different. So none of the previous methods that I mentioned will really help you out in this scenario. This is where you need to rely on IK retargeting. This is a new feature in Unreal Engine 5. It's our nuclear option for uh, when everything else fails, but you still want to uh, salvage some of your animation and transfer it between characters. So this is kind of what we're going to concentrate on for the remainder of this because it's fairly sophisticated. It's also powerful and it has a lot of use cases um, and it's new. So let's go over it. <clears throat> so at a high level, how does this thing work? Um, it's exactly like copy pose for mesh. So we deliberately designed it to work under the same paradigm so that if you know how copy pose for mesh works, you now have retarget pose for mesh. And whereas before you would make a copy pose for mesh node, now you make a retarget pose for mesh node. It's a yeah, exactly the same, and you copy from a source mesh component. Um, the only difference is that this node here um, doesn't make any assumptions about your source skeleton. You need to tell it how your source and your target relate to each other, and the way you do that is through a IK retarget asset. So we can go through now and uh, actually talk about the IK retarget asset, and then after this, we'll go ahead and make one. Okay, so what is involved in the setup of an IK retargeter? You first of all create an IK rig for your source, then you create an IK rig asset for your target, then you create an IK retargeter asset, and you use that retargeter to glue your source and target IK rigs together. So there's three assets, there's always three assets involved. There's your source, your target rig, and then the retargeter which connects them together. Um, yeah, once you have an IK retargeter asset, then you can use the retarget pose from mesh node to run it at runtime in your animation blueprint. Uh, crucially, though, there's also the option to use it offline to generate new animation sequences, new assets completely, um, which you can then you know refine further using the animation and engine tool set to to add some you know custom bespoke love to it, or you could export it if you want to a DCC wherever you do your animation. The point is. Um, this is not just a runtime tool, it's also an offline tool which you can use to create new animations. Okay, so let's take a look at how that uh, actually works in Unreal, in Lyra. You guys see my screen? Yes. Awesome. 
Okay. Okay. So, so just as I said, uh, we need to create two IK rigs. Um, now, what we'll, what I wanted to do in this uh, in this demo was replace the main player character in Lyra from this mannequin. Um, I'm going to put a, a lion in here. So I found a lion on the Unreal Marketplace, and uh, show you his skeletal mesh. this guy and replace him so the reason i picked this is because not because you would probably ever want to do this but it drives home the point that like there really doesn't need to be much commonality between your skeletal meshes for the ik retargeter to actually work um so this is kind of the worst case scenario like things are you know you're transferring what looks like a you know a normal human being perhaps in a rubber suit <laughs> onto a an animal that's a quadruped Okay, so let's start by creating an IK rig for our lion. And I just got this off the marketplace. He's, a, he's in the permanently free collection, so you could try this yourself if you wanted. What's going on here? Let's try that again. So you right-click animation, IK rig, lion. Now the convention that we go for at Epic is to prefix, prefix IK rig assets with under IK underscore. So we'll call that our IK line. I'm going to pop that open, and you have this new editor in Unreal Engine where you can uh, see the hierarchy of the character on the left hand here, um, a viewport with the skeleton, and uh, there's a stack of solvers. I mean, this is kind of outside of the scope of, of this tutorial, but we'll go through and, and set this guy up just for retargeting. So I'm going to grab basically all his legs and tail. I'm going to shift select those. And we'll right click on him and select new retarget chain from selected bones. And it will kind of go through and split up our selection into, um, into separate chains. So we'll go through and name these. Pull this left arm. The right arm, leg, bear with me. Tail. And then I couldn't use that auto splitting on, on this section here. We need to actually split his spine, neck, and head separately, but because they're all in one line, the algorithm can't really distinguish them, so we'll do it by hand. So I'm going to grab just his spine joints and create a new retarget chain called spine. I'm going to grab just his neck and make one called neck. And just the head, one called head. OK, so you can see we've filled up all these chains over here. And you can see when you grab them, it highlights the, the bones that belong to that chain. And so the way the IK retargeter works is you have this, like I said, a source IK rig and a target IK rig. So this is going to be the target. This is the IK rig that we're copying animation onto. And we need to be able to point to a source chain and say, hey, the left arm on the lion should copy its animation from the left arm on the mannequin, right? So we're splitting our skeleton up into chains, and then we're going to map those together and use it to transfer animation across. Uh, Another aspect of, of this, so you, you could actually do it just like this, and this would be a, called a, an FK transfer. We're also going to add IK to this, and that's going to be useful for uh, maintaining contact points and getting more control over the resulting animation. So to add IK, it's fairly easy. You just add the, the parts that you want to control contact points on. So in this case, the toes and his feet. We're going to right-click and set, uh, select new IK goal. It pops up and asks you what solver you want to use. We're going to use the full body IK solver and hit OK. And then you'll see the solver pops up in the solver stack down here. You can add as many of these as you want and they execute from uh, top down. Um, most, more often than not, though, you're, you're good with just one full body IK. And uh, you'll see that there is some setup involved and it's going to be grayed out until you finish that. So um, you also need to specify a root bone. This is the bone on the character where the solver starts, and everything above that it's going to ignore. So we're going to have it move the pelvis. So you right-click and set root bone on selected solver. And at that point, it's lit up. There's no more warnings. So now we can grab our goals in the viewport here, these, these yellow boxes, 
and move those around. You can see that it's solving the IK. So wherever these goals go, it's going to try and reach those goals and you know generate a pose where um, the contact points are being maintained. So just, a, just to talk briefly about IK rig in general, this is uh, certainly useful for IK re for retargeting is probably its primary use. You can also embed an IK rig directly into an animation blueprint and drive the position of these goals at runtime using any kind of uh, you know C++ component or blueprint script that you want. Um, the IK rig will initialize itself on the incoming pose in the animation blueprint and then modify it from there. So you can preview that in the editor directly. If we make him walk, for example, um, you can actually modify you know his his pose while he's animating so I can take his his feet here and like move them up and down while he's walking so you can see what that would look like at runtime and this is how you could start building something like a, a ground alignment system where you you, know, you could do ray casting and move these goals up and down depending on the height of the terrain underneath the character but uh, that's kind of out of the scope for today I just just wanted to give you a hint of that now, before we finish our retargeting setup, we need to actually assign the goals to the chains that they belong to. So the left leg is going to take the left toe goal. The right leg is going to take the right toe goal. Left arm takes the left finger goal and the right finger goal. Okay, so we have left arm, right arm, each with its own goal. Left leg, right leg, each with its own goal. And the tail, we actually don't need the tail. You can delete that. Um, we have spine, neck, and head. So we're going to, we're going to, map those two parts of our uh, mannequin that we're copying from. That's all we have to do for our IK rig. So let's create an IK retargeter. And we're going to pick now the IK rig that we want to copy from. And Lyra comes with a set of IK rigs for the common skeletons that you're, you're likely to encounter. Um, in, the case, uh, in this case, we're, we're wanting to copy from the mannequin. So I'm going to select that. And the convention we use at Epic is to use uh, RTG to prefix all of our retarget assets. And then we use something like um, the source and then two and then the targets. So we're going to say this is our retarget from Manny to the lion, right? Open. You can see now it's it's got the source IK rig up here that we selected and the target is empty. So we're going to set that to the lion. And by default, it's <laughs> um, it will have mapped our chains together. So if we go to the chain mapping tab here, you can see the spine has been mapped to the spine, head to head, and so on. And it's just using a fuzzy string matching algorithm. Um, it doesn't always get it right, so definitely double check. You know, there's no there's no even guarantee that you've named your chains consistently across all your IK rigs. So there's no problem. You can go in here and set this to whatever chain you want. But um, because we named things the same, it's it, it was able to automatically map it. Um, so now what you need to do is make sure that the retarget pose for your lion is roughly aligned with the mannequin's A pose here. And that is going to take a little bit of work. So if you bear with me, I'll show you how that works. We're going to edit his default pose. So I'm going to hit the Edit Pose button up here. You'll see he snaps into his reference pose. And then from here, I can rotate bones. Um, and translate things as needed. So I'm going to rotate his root. Oh. Not working. I'm not sure what's going on here. Give me a second while we figure this out. Might have, I didn't set a retarget route. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so there's there's a very key part that I missed. Back in the IK rig asset, um, you need to set the retarget route, and that tells the retargeter uh, where on the skeleton you want to start copying animation. Like what's the root of the retarget? Leave. We should be able this. to. I love because that's something I would absolutely forget to do. <laughs> I have done this a thousand times and I forget it every time. I should mention also, this has been uh, revamped quite significantly for Unreal Engine 5 or 5.1. 
And in 5.1, you would get there's a output window down here where you would get a nice a nice flashy warning saying, "Hey, you forgot your retarget root." But uh, we don't have those niceties in 5.0. I'm going to rotate his legs back down, and we're getting something kind of like a bipedal pose here. Um, but I am going to add a tail just so I can get that tail out from between his legs. I'm not going to copy animation onto it, but I'm just going to use it to uh, so that I can modify its base pose. And then let's get his spine pointing forward. Good enough. And we ought to fix up these arms. You can see he's got his arms splayed outwards and he's, you know, facing forward. So I'm going to increase the bone size here so I can get a look at these clavicles. I'm going to switch the gizmo to world space and then kind of orient these clavicles out a little bit. Move his arms out. And let's get his hands kind of a little bit closer. Okay, so that's not great, but it's a, it's a start. You could, you could spend more time kind of tuning the retarget pose, but let's take a look at that. So we'll go back into our asset browser in the retargeter here, and you can select any of the animations um, from your source skeletal mesh. So I think there's a armed walk. We can use to test. Okay, so here we go. We've got uh, animation as it is being transferred from the mannequin to a to a lion. Um, from here, you have this is cursed. <laughs> I know, right? Um, from here, you can you can modify the the resulting animation um, more or less depending on whether or not there's IK on it. But for each chain, you can select the chain and go through. There's the ability to uh, blend the animation off. So, for example, I could take the spine and blend all the rotation of the spine off. So his spine is just going to stay as it was in the retarget pose. I'll bring that back on. If the chain has has IK on it, like the legs, um, then these IK adjustments here are activated, and you can uh, blend blend to source is an interesting one. So at zero, uh, it's going to generate an IK lo goal location that's in the same direction as the source limb. But if you want the actual end point of the chain, like you, to be at the exact same position, if you want the lion's foot, for example, to be exactly where the mannequin's foot is, then you would blend to source to one. Um, and that's handy for maintaining contact points. So like imagine you have an animation of a character opening a door and you want to make sure that the hand isn't just in the right general location, but actually on that doorknob, the way the source animation is, you could then blend to source uh, to one and that hand will, you know, the retargeted hand location will go exactly where the source is. So you can maintain contacts that way. Uh, you also can just apply static offsets. So if I like start pulling his leg up, you can see he's, you know, going up and down. Um, you can put it in and out, and uh, we actually revamped this significantly for 5.1. There's um, ability to adjust the stride warping along the movement direction. You can splay. There's all kinds of stuff, but uh, we won't spoil that too much. Um, so I'm happy with the retargeter. Now let's actually replace the character, the playable character in Era. So I'm going to find the blueprint for the character. It's called B Manny. Pop that open. And you can see there's this little blurb here that tells you all about copy post from Mesh, but we're experts on that now, so we don't need to read that. And if you look at the skeletal mesh component, you can see he's set to use the, the mannequin skeletal mesh, no surprise there. And he's set to use a animation blueprint that's using copy post from Mesh. So he's like 
the people who set this up, they know a priori that the Manny is is the right skeleton for the job, so they can use copy post to just blanket copy those transforms over from the source animation onto them without any retargeting. But we need uh, to actually use the lion, so we're going to switch this to the lion. And now we need an animation blueprint. So let's set one up from scratch for retargeting. So we're going to go under animation, animation blueprint. Going to create a, a blueprint for our lion. Call it ABP lion retarget. That open. Create a retarget close from mesh. Connect that to our output. And we need to reference the retargeter. So in the details panel, we're doing Manny to lion, that one that we just made. And that's it. So all this whole animation graph does is copy a pose from a source component, which in this case, it's using the attached parent component. Um, it runs it through the retarder that we've specified here, and then it spits out a pose, and that's the final pose. Now back in our character blueprint, we're going to tell it you're using the lion skeletal mesh and that lion retarget animation blueprint. file. And if we play, hopefully that works. There we go. So we have a lion running around, <laughs> a live retargeting animation from what should be a mannequin skeleton onto, uh, onto our lion. Now, I should point out some things here. Um, the IK retargeter is not magic, right? It copies animation from a source skeleton to a target skeleton. And it kind of does it verbatim. So it's going to, you know, whatever you get in, it's going to put it out. It doesn't know anything about gameplay systems. So you can see there a floating handgun in front of the character, right? Now, the handgun is still at the location where a mannequin is expected to grip it. But our lion is like nine feet tall. And, you know, so he's, we've got floating handguns here. So... When you're coming up with a strategy for retargeting and transferring animation in your game, um, consider that just because the IK retargeter can copy animation onto any proportioned character, that doesn't mean it's not going to break your whole game, right? Like, there's no guarantee of doors being tall enough for this guy to walk through, or the guns being in the right location, or you know, the myriad of other ways in which character proportions can break your game. But you now have this option. Um, so you could, you know, refine this, uh, maybe scale the character down in, in Maya, bring him back in, you know, make the necessary adjustments so his paws are actually gripping the gun and uh, and make it work that way. Um, I should also mention that the runtime retarget that we're seeing here has an associated cost. It's not, I don't think it's terribly expensive. Like this is probably on, on my PC on the order of like, in one milliseconds, but you know, if you're doing that for 100 characters, it's going to start adding up. It's certainly slower than just uh, transferring the animation directly, right? Um, and so, if you find that, and, and you know, maybe you want to actually make some more modifications to the animation, like there's some, you know, you're getting some wonky results that where copying the emotion verbatim onto a lion doesn't give you what you want. There's that's almost certainly going to be the case as your target skeletal mesh gets further and further away. So for, in that case, what we recommend is people use this as, a, as an offline tool. So you transfer your actual animation sequences and generate new animation sequences, which you can then modify um, manually, sort of you can customize to your, to your liking. So you can you could take the, you know, the, the run forward animation that, you've, that we've got here, give it to an animator and actually you know, fine tune and tweak it as needed. And you're in that way, you can hopefully get to an end result much faster than if you'd had to start from scratch. So yeah, um, that's IK retargeting and swapping characters in Lyra. Hopefully, it, you know it gives you a, a you got a good un understanding of the options available to you for retargeting in Unreal Engine Five. Why you would choose the different retargeting options that are available to you, um, and um, yeah. That's it. <laughs> so uh, I have a question. I guess for you. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you were to use on the hands like blend to source, would that mean that the hands went to that mm -hmm. front? 
and but it would hold again uh, on spot. Yeah, so I mean, we could try that. Yeah, I want to see that. We pop open our retargeter, and Jose wanted to blend the hands to the source. So I'm going to select them both, set blend to source to one. I don't think it's going to live update, but if we rerun it, it should. Uh, how do I detach? They look way more cramped, so probably. Uh, you can press uh, <laughs> next to L. I, I got it here. So yeah, you can Run see hands, like yeah. yes, his his paws are on the the gun now, but you know, like I said, it's not magic. So he's his arms are yeah. just like right in his chest, and there's all kinds of crazy stuff. So actually, what I would do from here is is you know think about a system that moves the gun around based on the the player that that's the skin that's being used. So you know you could imagine a data table with a, a list of skeletal meshes and offsets for weapons and things like that to kind of patch up these these situations, but um, yeah, that's blend to source. <laughs> I can't handle it looking around. <laughs> I really can't. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cursed. <laughs> that's probably the single most cursed thing we have ever shown on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have put a little like uh, warning at the start of the episode. I don't know. Yeah, there should have been a disclaimer. Yeah. Also, <laughs> yeah, in situations. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say that it's all downhill for me for me because nothing I show is gonna be better than the lion. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean this this stuff is a lot of fun. It's also, as I'm sure you've you you've guessed pretty finicky like there's a lot of ways that things can go off the rails um the example that i'm showing that you can see on screen right here where his arms are crossed through each other so to fix that you would go back into your retarget pose this is just the retarget pose most certainly being um not identical enough so you know the what should be a a, a pose like this ends up being a pose slightly over like that because our retarget poses aren't matching um yeah, so there's there's a lot of tuning involved to actually make this work in a production environment. Um, but uh, there's a lot of control available to you to actually make that work if if you have the the inclination. And uh, for 5.1, there's just a ton more adjustments for chain. So you can do things like adjust the pull vector. Um, you have finer, finer control over the IK goal positions generally. Um, to achieve whatever it is that you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, so unless there's any more questions about this cursed line. <laughs> there's um, there's quite a few questions that have come up, but most of them we can probably group together for the end. Um, in case there's, I'll look and see if there's any that are super particular about what we just went over. But for the most part, I think chat in general is trying to recompose itself. So I think this would be a great point to uh, see what else you guys have in store for us. Awesome. OK, sure. Uh, and I, I guess I'll move on to not lion stuff. Uh, I wish I could do it with lion in the future. Uh, but I'll go on and, and show the other animation systems from Unreal Engine 5 or came in late in, in Real Engine 4 lifetime that we'd use to use and improve in Lyra and then make new ones for, for Lyra. So um, I, I recommend that um, uh, the Lyra animation uh, sample, uh, I mean, the animation part of this sample, it is meant to sort of like teach you how to use these features as you're going through them. So I do recommend that when you dive into Lyra animation, you also sort of like have this animation in Lyra document uh, in hand, so you can like read the specifics of what is uh, of what is going on. What I'm going to show here. Uh, the main uh, the main thing is animation blue. Uh, if you go over here to content browser, everything uh, just like Trent said with your targeter, we're using ABT for anything animation blueprint related, uh, and this is the one that you're going to want to find the mannequin base. So. 
previously on uh, Red Engine 4. Uh, this part hasn't uh, changed much. We, we still have the anim graph and we still have the event graph. Uh, but one thing you'll find interesting here is that the event graph on Lyra is absolutely empty. We, we don't use that anymore. So event graph uh, usually has been used as the place where you're going to sort of pull information through gameplay. Like, is my character crouching? Is my character running, jumping? Like, all this kind of information that you want to use to drive your animation. Uh, this has always been uh, performance intensive uh, because it's been uh, running on game thread. Uh, that just means that everything that you're going to do doing here is, is, is going to be done in the least efficient way possible. But now in Unreal Engine, in Unreal Engine 5, we have this new blue looping thread safe update animation that we use for the bulk of our work. That sort of, uh, it, it runs on a different thread. Uh, so if you're in if the system that's running your game can use it, it's just going to be overall more efficient. Whether you're using Blueprint or C++, it's going to be faster. Uh, over here, um, you're going to see this nice thing that Aaron Cox left for us in the animation blueprint uh, that's uh, called the comment tours. So you can find them by just typing in find results. You can start with number one, and you'll find this one. You can do number two, and you'll find the next one. So this sort of will guide you along uh, so that you can find, uh, maybe I missed something. This is the next step, the, the next reasonable step into learning how the animation system was built. So I'm not going to follow these around. Uh, I'm sort of going to like reference them as we find the, the different things in, in the AnimGraph layout. Uh, but I'm just going to go straight into AnimGraph. So the AnimGraph, uh, it sort of uh, it does all the things that you uh, you traditionally done in Unreal Engine 4. You can do your uh, pose adjustments, IK. You can run a control rig. Uh, you can do layer blends for your upper body and lower body split. Uh, but uh, the most important part here that I'm going to be uh, referencing is the locomotion state. So this is uh, a regular state machine that shows you the different uh, states that your animation can be in, uh, referenced by gameplay. And uh, one thing you'll find interesting here, as opposed to all the, uh, other examples, is that none of these, uh, or at least mo most of these, they don't have the animation clip that they're going to play. So that means that this animation blueprint is sort of like a, a skeleton of this is, these are all the states and all the functionality that all of my characters and animation and weapons and sort of like everything are going to have, but they don't have the animation clips. Uh, themselves. That means that if you have a different weapon or you have a different ability, we sort of want it to be asset separated in that sense. That you don't want to make a huge, gigantic uh, state, machine, uh, state machine layout where you're you sort of like, this is my gun state, this is my shotgun state, this is my rifle state. You, you don't want any of that. So I'm sure one of these comments is going to point you to the other asset that contains uh, that information, but I'm just going to go uh, straight. Uh, you have uh, the, the features that we've used for the Lyra animation blueprint uh, is called linked animation layer. It means that different weapons or different items, they can use a whole different animation blueprint for portions of your animation graph. So if you see places like this one with blue that says full body start state, or if we go back to the main anim graph, you'll see another one that says full body additives, full body aiming. Those are all layered. That means that a different animation blueprint is going to have that part of it. And if you want a different weapon to override the whole layer setup, you can do this stuff. Uh, if you go over here to class settings, you're going to find implemented interfaces over here. And this will take you to. Here. Uh, this, uh, here you can define and add new layers to your, uh, your layer interface. And this sort of says, these are the places where I want to overwrite or inject animation. Uh, these are going to be the named, uh, the named slots or nodes in your graph. And a different animation blueprint is going to be able to use uh, these names to sort of have their new anime blueprint layer. You can add new ones. You can change what they receive. For example, 
the aiming layer. Uh, so we use this for aiming up like, guns like this. Uh, it's going to need your controller's uh, pitch, yaw, et cetera. Uh, well, in this case, just pitch, just pitch and yaw. But you can define that in the layer itself right here. You can say, I want to receive a pose, but I also want to receive the yaw, uh, a float for yaw. And a float for yaw. So now let's go to the other animation blueprint. That's called the item layers base. And if you go here on the left, uh, animation layers, you're going to see all of, the, all of the layers that we have defined in that layer. For example, if we go to the aiming layer, see right there, it receives the yawn pitch. And now it can do whatever it wants. A uh, uh, reason why we want this on layers, there's different weapons and items in whatever your game is going to be that may have a different uh, that might have a, a different use case uh, for uh, for how its aiming is going to work. In a gun, like if I can get the camera on me again. Uh, if you get your gun, it's going to be aiming up and down. That's fine. But if now you have a bow, you're going to need your charging state. And that's an extra added layer of complexity that only your bow really needs. And you don't really want all of your other weapons to have all that garbage in their graph, uh, polluting what's going to go on there. And that allows you to say, like, hey, now my bow is going to use an aiming layer, but it's going to maybe have a blend space for charging the string. Or maybe when it's not fully charged, you're going to aim until that happens. You can do all of that in this layer itself. Now, I sort of. Uh, Light a little bit when I said that uh, all of our assets, like we don't reference assets in the other animation blueprint because we do it in the layer. Uh, if you see over here, I'm going to go to my cycle state, or actually, yeah, I'll just go to my cycle. So that's just yog state. You have a sequence player. Uh, this one is the only one we'll care about right now. And this is just my running animation. And you'll see that it references, uh, it references an animation. We're going to go in here. These are anim node functions, which is a, a new feature in Unreal Engine 5 that lets you run logic whenever a specific node comes into relevance. Uh, when it comes into relevance, it means that the animation that's going to play, it has some weight. So this node has weight. Uh, you can have events for when the anim graph first initializes, when this node becomes relevant, when this node updates. So you can call this every frame. Uh, in this case, we pick between our cardinal directions, uh, which animation we're going to play based on, uh, based on some selection that we're doing on Blueprint here, whether we are crouching or not. Uh, it all works on the same sequence player. You're, we're just switching which uh, sequence you're going to play. And you'll notice that right here, we're setting the sequence of the animation node. Uh, this comes from this variable over here. And when I go to that variable, you'll notice all my cardinal directions are empty. So there's no clip references there of any kind. And that's good, because if you have a different run, a different uh, weapons, and you want to run with all of them, then you, need, uh, you would need more than just the four cardinal directions. You would need four cardinal directions per weapon. So uh, what we do here is we're using a child animation blueprints to define, uh, hey, I, these are the clips that I want these are the animation sequences that I want my other weapon to use. And I'll show you that, how to do that right now. So I'm going to go back here. And we're going to just find the pistol layer. Or rifle is fine. So right here is the rifle layers. And you'll see that I can't edit any of the layers. I can't really do anything other than modify uh, blueprint functions, uh, like event graph, or overwrite one of the many functions that our main animation blueprint has. But what we can do is we can change the uh, properties that we have on all of our variables here. So we're sort of using uh, blueprint variables as our animation set. In, in the past, it's been pretty common to uh, maybe have a different uh, blueprint or a data asset or some sort, of, some sort of asset where you can say, these are the animations that I want this weapon to play. Uh, in Lyra, we have them all in the same animation. So if I were to want uh, to change any of these animations, it would just update. Uh, it, it would just replace uh, what that item layer's animation blueprint has on it. So in Lyra, if you want to make a new weapon with new animations, you would just 
a go to your item layers and you would right click that and create a child animation blueprint and I call this my new weapon and now you have the same things that we saw before and you can just start slotting them in based on the animations that your new weapon has now in my case I'm I'm usually lazy so I just duplicate another one that already is a child animation blueprint of the item item layers uh, but you can uh, you can figure out what, what workflow uh, suits you best. Uh, now what I'm going to show you is how switching weapons switches which animation layers we're using. So to not forget and not get mm -hmm. killed by bots, I'm going to save on them. Let's all do it. Yes. Okay, so right here, I have the pistol. Uh, and if I go here to the main animation blueprint without uh, the layer implementations, I have a spawned animation blueprint right here. And you see that it's running, and once it goes into these layers, it sort of like says, like, hey, this is going to be running on this other animation blueprint. And it's this one right here, items layers. So. Even though all of our different weapons uh, uh, are not this exact blueprint, but they inherit from it, it's still going to show up here on uh, the debug selection. So you'll see here it's running pistol. And if I go to the pistol there, I need to find that asset. Uh, oh, yeah, you see pistol. You'll see that I have it right here. But now, if I go over and pick up gun, now I have a new layer. You're going to see it right here. Rifle layer. Right there. I no longer have. I no longer have a, a pistol layer here, and now I have my new rifle layer. So this really allows you to like separate. Hey, this this is the animation blueprint that's doing all the animation selection. So if I want to know like, which animation is actually playing and such, uh, or what is the state of this current blueprint, you can go to this one. If you want to see the animation blueprint in a broader sense of these are the states I'm on, rather than the states individually, you're going to be going to ABP underscore mannequin base. Now I'm going to, uh, I think that's it for layers. Now I'm going to go uh, with the new post warping features that we have in, uh, in Unreal Engine 5. So uh, what I was showing before, cardinal directions, so you have like your north, south, east, west uh, of how the character is going to move that maps to that. But if my character is going to be moving uh, diagonally, uh, I still need to sort of like make an in-between of that. And uh, the, the bad part about this is that some, uh, very often my walk, uh, you could use a blend space for all of your directions. But if my running right animation looks like this, and my running left looks like this, my running backwards looks like this, and running forward looks like that. If, I, if I'm if i doing blend spaces, depending on which phase of the of the, of the jog cycle I'm on, we may end up blending like differences, uh, differences, and we're going to end up with a lot of leg crossing. So what you're going to sort of want to end up doing is, uh, instead of using a blend space, you sort of want to select like if I if I am going in a certain direction, use this animation. If I'm going in, be in between, hold that animation until I maybe reach a, a threshold of the next one, and then switch to the other one. What you're gonna see there is what you're gonna sort of try to go to a flat place here. I'm gonna go forward, and I'm gonna start heading towards left, and then it switches to my left animation. Then if I start going right, I'm gonna switch to my right animation. And it can be done smoother, it can be done uh, it's snappier, that's really up to your graphs layout. Uh, but if we're holding the same animation in uh, if we're holding the same animation in a different direction than the one it was authored to, we sort of need to do some dynamic pose adjustments to make sure that this run forward looks good at 20 degrees and that it looks good at 45 degrees or whatever distance it's gonna be. And for that, we use this new feature in Unreal Engine 5 that's called Orientation Warping. So I'm going to go find the node right now. We go to the cycle state that I was on before. Now we can look at the rest. 
you're gonna see the node right here, orientation working. Uh, we have comments on certain things, so if you see like something that maybe doesn't make sense, chances are we're gonna have a comment there that explains this, this scenario. Uh, orientation warping, I'm gonna disable it right now so you can see exactly how it would look with and without. Console command a.animnode.orientation warping dot enable zero. So now that it's disabled and I'm running in the diagonal, you're just gonna see my character is skating and I'm moving in a different direction. Uh, with orientation warping, you're gonna uh, you're gonna reorient uh, the lower body or the upper body, depending on how you look at it, and you're gonna do uh, spine adjustments and feet adjustments so that they match the direction that you're going to. And you have no foot, uh, foot skating or sliding, or you're seeing here. I'm gonna enable that again. Uh, now, the interesting thing about the setup of our orientation warping in in Lira is that if you think about it, when you're running, it makes sense to have orientation warping. If you're standing still, it doesn't make sense to use orientation warping. Uh, but if you are in a start animation, uh, if, if you're in a start animation or you're in a stop animation, you're sort of going to start on an idle and you're going to slowly start moving towards uh, your cycle animation. So in, in those cases, maybe it doesn't make sense to use orientation warping for a start. Or maybe it doesn't make sense to use it for the first portion of a start. And the good thing is that you can have this orientation warping node just in the states that you need it for. So in the case of a, in the case of cycle, we have that. In the case of the star, uh, not the star, the idols, we just have a clip for that, like a state machine that uses that. And then for stops, we sort of do the same thing. And then if you want uh, you want like more orientation warping or less orientation warping or you want to turn it on you want to turn it off you can let your blend your, your blending between states sort of do that for you or you can drive an alpha like we're doing with this other node over here i'm saying that the longer i'm going through this animation the more i'm going to start enabling uh, yeah you can use it first state. Uh, question next... jose where, where did, yep. uh, sorry where does that start alpha come from is that, uh, is that I'm gonna authored go, on the clip? It is uh, authored on... We, we didn't want to author it per clip because there was just so much content. So we say, like, if you're 0.5 seconds into the animation, we start blending it. So you, you play the start, and it would probably look better if you we did it for every clip individually. But it would look good enough for 99% of the cases with just that 0.5 and 4 seconds. And I'm going to show you how that's set up in a little bit. First, I want to go over what sprite warping actually means. So if I'm moving a mouse and keyboard, like, are like you're going full speed or non full speed, but if you're playing with a controller, you might be going like faster, you, you might be going slower, depending on what you're doing. And you're going to notice in Lyra that it doesn't matter how slow I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to adjust the sprite of my animation to match uh, my character's uh, my character's speed and have no foot sliding. So the way we do that is with that warping node called sprite warping. Uh, you're sort of going to see this combo of orientation warping that's next to a sprite warping node. Uh, what it would look like without sprite warping? I'll do it right here. I see right there that I'm doing the full stride even though my character is moving really slowly. So the thing that we do here that's, that's interesting is that you have multiple options of making your character's speed match, uh, match the uh, intended uh, character's movement speed versus what the animation is doing. You could A, uh, increase of your animation or you could sprite warp. Uh, each one of them has its limits. It's sort of like a 20% up, 20% down as an industry standard. That means that you can increase play rate by 20%, reduce it same. You can increase the sprite by 20 or lower it by 20. Uh, and what we do in Lyra is we do play rate until you can't do play rate, and then we sprite warp. So uh, what you're going to see here is that when I'm moving really slowly, even though I have no sprite warp, my animation is sort of going to start cycling slower, even though it has full sprite. 
And we've set it to be like 15 to 20 percent, uh, like like I like I said before. And I'm gonna uh, and I'm gonna show you how we do that right here. Let's go to the cycle. The cycle is right here, and like I said before, update cycle, and we do the same thing, the animation selection. But the difference here is that depending on the character's speed, we set the play rate to match the speed based on some uh, on some limits that we define here. So here's what you're gonna see: 20% down, 20% up. Uh, this is just the capsules, uh, the actual actor's uh, movement speed from the character movement component. Uh, and we just feed that directly into this new node to uh, so that the animation can match that speed based on the information from the animation clip itself. What this means is that you're, you somehow need to know how fast your character, your animation moves. So, uh, and for that, we use the root motion information from the animation clip. I'm gonna open one of those animation clips. One of those animation clips. Uh, no animations here. Strange. Okay, I'll just find it in your content browser. And I think it might be dog or uh, this one works. So all of our animations in Lira, they're they're imported with root motion information. So if I go here and I just loop and reset, you're gonna see there's actually a root motion. So we know how much, how fast the character was moving when the animator authored his animation. And now this one, just do jump forward, that's fine. And with this information, as long as your animation has it, that node will do uh, everything for you automatically. We don't uh, have to so yeah, use an anim modifier? No, you don't have to use an anim modifier. But uh, there's cases where you use an anim modifier, and I'm going to go to those right now. Uh, oh, OK. Yeah, so, so this one, it, it just uses root motion information. But for example, uh, we have another technique that's new for Unreal Engine 5 that's called distance matching. That basically means if my character has moved 100 units, then I want my animation to advance 100 units worth of motion too. Uh, the same way you can use it in reverse if your character is landing uh, on the ground. Uh, you know what distances this animation that you authored for like have based on that root motion information or some curve that you generate. Like, basically, the, the animator that animated this knew what height he was animating it for. So now I can say if my character is falling and he's 100 units from the ground, I can find the keyframe in the animation that is 100 units from the ground and play it perfect. So you, that's what you can use distance matching for. Uh, our start animations, like I was saying before, we sort of want this warping to occur on the running part of the animation, but we don't want it to happen on the idle part of the animation. When you're going from an idle or from a stopped position to a non-stopped position, it is better to use distance matching. And when your character is already in motion, it might be better to use that play rate adjustment on top of that right warping uh, adjustment. Uh, so that's where the right warping alpha comes in. And let me just try to find it again. And I'll probably just have to find it here. Right warping alpha. So right click this, find references. I'm going to see all the places where this is used. Uh, this is setup start anim. So what, what I said before about the anim node functions, you're going to find this here on this clip, on, on this sequence evaluator. So whenever this animation becomes relevant, I will run this setup. And whenever this animation clip updates, I'm going to run the on update. So when this starts, we set the start warping to 0. We know anima start animations will always start with sort of the idle stop position. And I'm going to press stop here. because the game is right. It starts in the stop position. So we want to start with the start warping alpha to 0. And then as our character advances, or our clip advances, we're going to say uh, this is the current time of the animation. We have a blend time. Uh, I use 0.15 seconds here. Uh, OK, we start blending 0.15 seconds after the animation starts. And then for this duration of 0.2 seconds here, we start blending in, blending out of distance matching and blending in sprite warping. And that's what drives the sprite warping out. Then at the same time, uh, 
this sprite warping feeds directly into it, it fits directly into my sprite warping alpha node. And then my sprite warping gets used differently to decide how we calculate this distance matching value. So distance matching is pretty simple uh, to set up. I have a minimal setup. Uh, well, I don't have it anymore. I guess I closed it without saving. Uh, but in the full land animation uh, state, we have probably the simplest version of uh, distance matching. All that we do is we get the distance to the ground, uh, and we feed that to a distance match target. But in this case, it's not as simple as root motion, because root motion could be going left, forward, right. Like what? exactly is being stopped how much do i want to advance so for that we do need an animation curve to tell us how much distance this animation is covering so for that we made a curve called ground distance for the fall animations and i'm gonna find a fall land here so you'll see here i have this ground distance curve that tells me how far away from the ground i am so here i'm 200 units away and then when i get here i am zero units away from the ground. Uh, the way you make this, uh, we made an animation modifier for Lyra that you can use. Uh, and it's here, distance curve modifier. This is also in Unreal Engine 5, so you, you, you can use it outside of Lyra to make your own curves. It may, you just may need to set up the nodes manually on your end to have your preferred distance matching setup. So here I'm just saying the axis I want to consider distance on is Z. And I want to consider the animation stopped at the end. So when you're, you're using a stop animation, uh, you will want to uh, enable this stop at the end. Because in a stop, you're moving, and then you're not moving. In, an idle, in a start animation, you're not moving, and then you are moving. So that's sort of like the cases where you would use one versus the other. And this just uh, you add the modifier, and it generates the curve for you. So if we go to start animation, like I was saying before, start forward. This one works. Uh, we have the same distance curve, but with different settings. We're considering x, y distance as your distance, and we're considering uh, we're not using stop at end because it's moving at the beginning. So the net result is that if you use stop at end, then your curve is going to go from like the high value to zero, and if you use it, if you disable it, it's going to go from zero to whatever value you're moving. So. Uh, as I was saying before with distance matching, let's say I'm here at 160 units, which is right here, and my character moved 160 units. That means that my animation is going to advance all the way over here in whatever span of time, uh, in whatever span of time that the animation, uh, in whatever way that the gameplay asks the animation to run. The downside of distance matching, uh, even in a situation like a start, is that if your gameplay is crazy and it's moving like three times as fast or something that would look unnatural, then you would essentially be playing this animation like this, really fast, like three times as fast, 10 times as fast to match exactly what the gameplay is doing. Uh, with stride warping and essentially like distance matching is adjusting play rate, we kind of want to follow the same rule of you only want to uh, increase or decrease play rate by that 20%. And that is something that we let you do in the uh, uh, that we let you do in the other not distance match to target but in the case like the start uh, here your advancing time by distance matching you can provide this a play rate clamp and generally the clamp is i guess we allow five times so i guess we're, we're sort of like not following our rule here but our content or an animation matches fairly well so we never really needed to clamp the upper limit of how fast the animation is going to play. But your project might. Uh, the nodes that you're going to be using for distance matching, it's all in the documentation, but they are advanced time by distance matching. It is a distance match to target. And then sort of like tangential is the, is the match to play rate that you saw before. These are the three ones that you're going to be using to do your play rate adjustment. And that's pretty much it on the post warping end of things. Uh, the one final thing I wanted to show you that's, uh, that's been pretty useful uh, for the development of, of Lyra is that 
when we put the, all of these features in Lyra, uh, we're putting them in a in a production environment in a production environment where like testing it on on our end, and we also throw, uh, show it to the world and see what bugs people find with it or what problems, what kind of work workflow improvements we can do. So I just wanted to show you how. Uh, Using all the new debug tools that Unreal has, we can sort of like identify problems in our Lyra setup, our no new nodes, and such. And it is something that we're using the same features that are available. So it's something that you could use yourself on your end. I'm going to go here to another map of uh, another map of Lyra, which is a top-down sample. It's Basically, like a, a Bomberman. Uh, and it's using the same animation blueprint that we're using on that other game mode, uh, but we're using it here. And one thing you'll notice uh, might be easier to see if I put it in slow motion. But you'll see that when I switch directions, my character does that, that weird flip. So to debug this, there's a, a new feature in Unreal Engine 5. Uh, it's called the Rewind Debugger. And I'm not going to go too into detail of uh, how it works. Uh, I'm just going to I'm just gonna uh, show how we would use it to find the bug and identify where in the graph it is, it is happening. That's in a separate tab there by your content browser. No, yeah, I think my. My cursor disappeared. Oh, I think it went to, yeah. Thank you. And we're going to select this character. Listening. Oh, I exploded myself because I need to restart. And the character is called Hero Arena. There you go. I have the character selected, and I'm recording it. And I'm just going to go and do the bug. Just did the bug a few times there. And now I can pause. And I can rewind in time and see exactly what's going on. So now I'm going to undock this so I can actually zoom in. And let's find this bug. Uh, Gonna disable the camera here, and you're gonna see the flip happens right there. So now that I know where the flip is, I can go find the animation blueprint of this guy that we just recorded, and I can use that option, open debug and graph. And now I can see exactly what was happening on this animation blueprint at the time that we were at the time that we were running this. So regarding states. We're going from, we're in an idle, we go into a start, and then the flip happens. There's no animation playing, so I find it very unlikely that it is uh, within these states that the error is happening. Uh, I find it way more likely that it's going to be outside of this graph. So I can see, uh, I can see what values my nodes had too with the stuff that you see on top of them. I'm just going to. Go here on Rewind Debugger and look at the flip on the screen. So I don't think these ones are live updating, but essentially what is, what is happening to me visually here is that the whole root of the character is moving 90 degrees. Uh, this rotate root bone that we have in the graph right here. Uh, I'm going to stop the Rewind Debugger session. Uh, this rotated root bone, we made it to, uh, for a turning place solution and for starts and stops uh, in, in Lyra. But Lyra is a strafe shooter. So you move around, you're always looking at where your gun is aiming at. And that rotated root bone doesn't make sense anymore for this, uh, for this character that is only moving forward and Nowhere else. So now I can. So now what I can just do is remove this, or maybe 
put it behind an alpha or a blend by bool or whatever other way that, that I may find. And that will just let me not have this problem in my top down. Then you can see my character moving. Now there's no snapping when I switch directions. I just follow the character's velocity like a real default character does. Nice. Yep. And that's pretty much it for me. That's what I had to show. And where was this stuff like a few years ago when I was making games? Right? I was just thinking that debugger in and of itself is such a time saver. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What I find funny is that a lot of these features, like not the rewind debugger, but the drop down in the debug, there's uh, another option that we uh, a feature that's called show, show debug animation that you can find it in the documentation. It's stuff that has been there, like even linked anime layers, they have been there for a while. But we haven't really had samples where we use them or content on the wiki where we show it. This is how you use it. And that's kind of stuff that we've been wanting to change. Uh, like a, a better example of how to use Rewind Debugger or even how to turn your Lyra character, that's a straight character, into a forward facing character, kind of like in City Sample. Uh, we have a blog post uh, with how to turn Lyra into that. So these are this is all new content that we want people we want people really to like know and get to use and give us their feedback on for Unreal Engine Five. Yeah, absolutely. So there you go, chat. You heard it. Make sure you go into Lyra and break it as best as you can and <laughs> give in your feedback. Awesome. Yeah, there were just there are so many different tools and tricks throughout that whole demo that was absolutely mind blowing genuinely so i first of all want to thank both of you for showing all of that incredible stuff um there's so many things here that i think will be incredibly helpful to the animators in this chat or even people that are just trying to pick up animation as well there's a lot of things in here that'll help make things a little bit smoother <laughs> run a little bit faster in their development process so thank you so much for going over a lot of that my pleasure. That was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, lighting, well, the lighting was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the lion. I'm sorry y'all had to was... see that. <laughs> Ugh, that's that's going to be nightmare fuel for a, a while, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, that's been my life for the last couple of years, developing <laughs> retargeting tools. It, I, I've created a lot of nightmares in my day, that's for sure. I think any animator could probably say the same. Yeah, I feel like at a certain point, <laughs> that's one of the fun aspects of animation is just making the most horrible, horrific stuff possible <laughs> just to see what, what you can. Yeah, you know, we get the best bugs. I've heard people say like, you know, oh, my character's upside down and inside out and people love it and they laugh, but I don't know about you, Jose, but I have a hard time laughing at it sometimes. I'm just like, oh God, what's going wrong now? And it's usually just one little thing somewhere that, hey, we have a re rewind debugger now that can help you find. So don't despair if uh, your character's legs going through its jaw. It's usually not that bad. <laughs> my, my favorite kind of bugs are the bugs that are actually intended features. Like in Fortnite, it's common to get a, a bug that says the character's e-posing. But that's an emote. So. There you go. <laughs> Intended. You just close it and move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's the perfect way of going about it. Um, that's actually, that's kind of an interesting question that now I'm curious about for both of you. What is the most extreme bug that either of you have encountered thus far? Do you want to go first, Karen? I need to check my memory bank. I, I try to block them out as soon as I close them. <laughs> um, I mean, coming from rigging backgrounds, rigid bodies are always the craziest things because they'll take full control of your skeleton and rip them to pieces and scatter them all over the map. So, you know, that's where you get the nice melting characters with like turning into a big puddle of meat soup. Um, those can be pretty <laughs> disturbing. 
Yeah, I think I've seen a, a couple of those those fun videos floating around. Uh, just seeing what can happen when you absolutely destroy <laughs> the rig. So, I, I think I have mine now. Uh, the in anim, anim, animation gameplay in general, like you, you very often want your your work to be unseen in the sense that this is what the animator, the animation that the animator did, this is what it looks like. And that's, you want to get it to look as close as that in, in the game. So animation, gameplay, like you notice when it's wrong, you don't notice it when it's, when it's right. Uh, when we added swimming in Fortnite, I, we had this problem where the character after, after swimming just stopped animating. It was just like, uh, on an A post, like for the rest of the match, and it was actually live for a whole week, I think. I think week. that happened to me while I was playing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry, that was my fault. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah, and I played the game, and it happened to me, and I was like, "What?" Is it? it was me. There was no, no one else around me. <laughs> <laughs> is that one that we can also say is an intended feature? You have if, unlocked a pose. <laughs> if it looks like this, it is not intended. But if it looks like this, it is intended because that's not our <laughs> that's not our ref pose. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. The classic uh, T posing for dominance in the match, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, if both of you are up for it, we have a couple of questions from the chat that we could dive into. That's good. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to um, ask them out, and then whoever wants to take it, go ahead and dive in for it. So first up, we have a question from Andrew W. Um, they asked, what are the corrective root bones in the UE5 Manny Skeleton utilized for? Um. I, I don't, I, he might be referring to like the twist bones. Um, those aren't really root bones, but they're like leaf bones. I think that's what he's mm -hmm. getting at. What do you think, Jose? Yeah. Right, so there's a, there's a, yeah, I can, I can dive into that. So that, that's kind of like a rigging feature for secondary deformation. So the idea is that you have your core skeleton that's your, like your shoulder, arm, your elbow, wrist, and so on. And these things are primarily what get animated, but there's a lot of other stuff mm -hmm. that needs to be done to maintain nice uh, preservation of volume, especially around ball joints like your shoulder or your wrist. Um, you can very easily reproduce this problem. Just grab a character by the wrist in any game and twist it like seven, 270 degrees. And instead of your radius and your ulna um, twisting around each other, you'll just get a little like, it'll look like a, like a candy wrapper. You're just spinning a candy wrapper and it, it'll just like just um, crunch up to nothing, right? You get this little singularity. And so, to counter that and many other deformation problems, we put a lot of extra bones into the UE5 mannequin that will counteract those problems. So as your wrist rotates, it counter rotates just that part of the wrist to kind of keep that volume better. And this happens in like the calf and thigh and the, the chest and the, the I think along the spine. So you'll see these little floating leaf, leaf bones all over the place that are driven procedurally at runtime based on the incoming pose. They'll counteract that pose in some way to to fix up the deformations for you. That is awesome. <laughs> I have to say, because especially the, like you were describing the candy wrapper sort of uh, metaphor is perfect for that. Um, I know my brief stint into animation, I, I cannot give you enough respect for being able to do it because I don't have the patience to be able to do it well. But I know when I was trying to bending the arm, like you were saying, just twisting it, I ended up just putting gloves on the character with a big old flare <laughs> at the wrist. <laughs> Why did I think of that? That's Hit the story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should say also, if, if you're interested in getting into that kind of level of detail in your game, then um, control rig is your home. You want to create a control rig that you slap into your animation blueprint after the whole uh, pose has been evaluated. You pump it into a control rig that then reads the incoming pose and can do things like, you know, rotating twist bones slightly and adjust, adjusting things as needed to fix things up. So that's a, that's kind of a whole profession unto itself. It, it gets a little bit complicated, but um, that's the idea. 
Yeah, that's awesome. What a great way to uh, kind of bypass some of those honestly very common issues, especially when it comes to character animation. There's just some weirdness <laughs> that tends to happen. So it's nice knowing that there are some features in there to help at least circumvent some of them as best as possible. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could add one more uh, thing next. to that. Hopefully, oh, yeah. sorry, I was just going to say, in the future, hopefully we have better deformation. So like there are some technological solutions on the horizon where we could have uh, deformation algorithms that don't candy wrapper. So um, I'm not making any promises, but keep your eye out for that. <laughs> Always pushing for better, right? The next question is also from Andrew W. Is copy pose from mesh supposed to be kind of thought as a superior methodology to master pose components? Yeah, you know, I didn't actually mention master pose. Um, is it superior? I'm coming in with um, the hardball questions. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so to, to give a little context there, master master pose component it gives you the ability to drive a separate skeletal mesh component with a you know drive a target skeletal mesh with a source much like copy pose um we don't really use it much anymore if i remember correctly it was it does rely on them being the same skeleton asset and i could be wrong there um but i you know i i, I guess the fact that i haven't used it in years and and you know see copy pulls from mesh all over the place is probably an indication that it, it's not as relevant as it used to be or even at all i have used it recently was recently, it you so know tell you the case yeah yeah i can tell okay, you the yeah. where you would want to use it so master pose it's from the same skeleton to the same skeleton it's actually the same bone transforms altogether so uh, master pose you can use it to copy like the pose from other stuff really simply but at least to me, the main use case is performance. It's like you want 200 different animated characters that all are going to share the same pose, or maybe like little, like uh, if, if you are familiar with the animation sharing manager, it uses the master pose component under the hood. And it lets you, it, it lets you bypass the whole animation update that can be very expensive if you have many characters. So it's, it's more of a performance thing. Than just... Oh, right. Yeah, I think so. Under the hood, the distinction is that there's no copying being made, right? Like it's literally just referencing the same bone yeah. transforms. Yeah. yeah. So you can skip a copy by using the master pose component. Yeah. You can make adjustments okay. on top of it. It's as is. As is. Yeah. Awesome. So it's definitely um, each of them are kind of a, a very situational usage, then. It depends on what end result you're going for really and what level of optimization is required for the project totally and that's a great question actually I, I, i'll put that in the presentation if i ever give it again there we go <laughs> live feedback <laughs> the next question is from one learner is there a retargeting solution needed for facial animations or does that not apply in those scenarios um, the none of the retargeting solutions that I mentioned today really have anything to do with facial animation per se. Um, most facial rigs in Unreal are driven with parameters. They're parameterized, uh, you know, curves usually going from zero to one. So, for like a, you know, for adjusting little micro expressions on the face to build up a, a face pose. So, by abstracting your face rig onto those kinds of normalized sliders. You kind of get retargeting for free that you've already abstracted your animation onto a normalized multi-dimensional space i guess <laughs> um and that will play back you know the same it's the same data regardless of what is what those parameters are actually driving under the hood uh oh this next question actually relates very much to um what we were talking about with the master pose so Medgard was wondering, how much does IK retargeting impact performance, if at all? Yeah, it does have a performance cost. I alluded to it uh, earlier. But it, um, for the, the scenario we did today, where we're running one full body IK solve um, on a skeleton on the order of like 50 joints, you can expect something on the order of like 0.1 milliseconds. So 
Uh, if you don't add any IK goals or any IK solvers to your IK rig, it will still retarget. It does a FK retargeting pass, which is a little bit faster. So you kind of have some scalability there in terms of how much you want to pay. Um, but it's on the order of 0.1 milliseconds on my PC. So, you know, it's it's not free, but it you could certainly use it in a in a game. But also tie it to the animation budget allocator. Your like it, it's sort of like gonna be a, like counted into your budget. So you have too many of these, or it's expensive. You're just gonna like not update them every frame. So it sounds like yeah, you're gonna start dropping frames and getting the little um, stop motion. Yeah. Suddenly have a claymation <laughs> video game mm -hmm. going. Um. What would you say is probably the maximum limit that you would recommend when it comes to that uh, to keep an ideal performance? I mean, it really depends on your platform and your game type. Uh, you know, you have to consider it holistically. You, have, you need to come up with a budget that's acceptable for your game, and each game is going to be different. You might have an army on screen or just one character in like a highly cinematic scenario, in which case you can just throw the kitchen sink at it and let it take, you know, 10 milliseconds if it has to, I guess. Um, well, probably not that much, but um, yeah, I mean, at uh, roughly speaking, I would say, you know, dozens is doable on a modern PC. More than that, and you're probably going to start running up against uh, budgeting issues. Budgeting and performance, they're never fun, but always necessary. <laughs> Let's see, next up, um, skills1333. Three, three, three. <laughs> uh, they're wondering, can you demonstrate how you would go about adding surface reaction similar to what's in the Valley of the Ancients demo in Lyra, um, where she holds her hand along the walls, for example? Um, I, I could talk about that a little bit. So in cases like that, you're taking some information from the world and feeding it almost certainly in, you know, into your animation system and probably into some IK. Um, so you can imagine your base animation state in, in the demo that he, that was mentioned in the question, the character reached out and touched the wall. So the animation might be, you know, here, but the wall is here. And at runtime, you can create a system either in C++ or in Blueprint that does some ray casting from the hand position. So you can cast a ray out in the direction that you're looking for, um, find where that hits, set an IK position, and run an IK solve in your animation graph with that position set. So that's kind of a high-level overview of of what what the my recommended approach would be. Um, as for specifics, um, you can use the IK rig in the Nanom graph. So you could create an IK rig that just has, say, uh, an IK chain going from the shoulder to the wrist. And you can drive a, a goal at the wrist location based on that ray cast result to move it in and out and make sure it stays in contact with the environment. Um, you're going to need to manage that state carefully to make sure that it comes on smoothly as the character approaches the wall and blends off smoothly as they get further away. Um, there's there's a few other IK options in Unreal, so you could also use some of the included IK that comes in the animation blueprint for that. Um, but I, I guess it, I should also mention there's, apart from IK, you could also consider using blend spaces. So you could have a blend space of the character reaching out fully extended and then crunched up as much as you can, and then you blend between them based on some normalized value that you've created based on your ray cast. So there's a lot of ways to skin that cat, but it usually boils down to using some sort of physics query, a ray cast or a shape cast of some sort to get some information about the surrounding world. Bang that through Blueprint into a format that is usually normalized in a range or, or you know, in the case of IK, resu results in a position in the character's component space, and then you've feed that in at the end of your animation blueprint to make a little fix up. 
Makes sense. What do you think, Jose? Kind of similar lines? Yeah, similar lines. And if you were to do this in Lyra, depending on what you do, like it, it's in a it's in a multiplayer environment in Lyra, so there's probably additional considerations to to take into account there. Uh, the way we replicate like specific animation uh, states uh, is like animation is sort of like cosmetically running on clients, but if it's a montage play through the gameplay ability system, the montages are going to replicate correctly. So in the case of the Valley of the Ancient, I believe uh, most of the interactions there are montages, so that would be just fine. Absolutely. Yeah, I should say too, like if the interaction isn't dynamic, it's just predetermined stuff, bake it out. Don't mess with any of this stuff. You know, don't don't try to complicate something and make it dynamic. If it if you can just get away with a pre-baked, pre-canned animation that lines up perfectly. Yeah, absolutely. Um actually now I have a selfish question. Um for when it comes to blending kind of both baked animations and dynamic animations, say uh, there's, let me see if I can think of an example. You're walking into a zone in a video game, for example, and there's a canned animation of the character opening the door and walking through and it revealing the world before them before obviously you have control of the character again and you can walk around and do things. Um, what do you think would be the best way to handle situations like that? So what you're saying is that you uh, you sort of want to play, like if you're affecting locomotion style, so you still want to be like sort of in control of this, you're probably going to do like, want to do like a, a swap in anim graph or like a swap in the assets that your animation blueprint is using. But if it's more like a, play my open door animation, and then you go into the world. Uh, there's like mm -hmm. things to consider, like alignment and such. And we have a uh, motion warping in, uh, that's new in UE5, and uh, there's examples for that in City Sample and Valley of the Ancient on how to use that. And it's still on experimental phase, and you're going to hear more about it soon. There's a contextual animation system that uh, will let you like author like, more complex interactions like that one. I mean, that one is fairly simple, so you can probably do with just motion warping. But for more complex mm -hmm. cases, there's stuff going on. This is awesome. I'm getting all of the little bits of insider information out. <laughs> Lots of keep an eye out. <laughs> I love that, getting the, the inside scoop on some of these new features. <laughs> yeah, contextual so animation system is question. awesome. Yes. <laughs> the next question is from Hit Pause. Um, would it be possible to get the lion, <laughs> our friendly neighborhood lion, to blend back into its natural um, animation blueprint real time? Um, actually, maybe Jose would know more about that. Like, you're you're basically yeah, sure. going to have to have to have a separate animation blueprint as a lion, right? And then yeah, my, my, my recommendation there, my recommendation there would be like, yeah, you, 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 you kind of want to do that. But if you're just like going to be overriding the whole thing, you can have your copy pose blend by alpha or blend by bull, and then your graph, right? Or you can feed this copy pose to somewhere else. Maybe like it's right. a node in the graph, so you can use it however you want. It sounds like yes. there's swapping animation blueprints. I'm not always a big fan of because we don't support blending when you do that. So often you you, you sort of want to like author it in the same graph or switch a layer in. Layering would be a, a great option there because switching, a, whenever you switch weapons in Lyra, you, you have a blend because you, you may be like in the middle of a run and then you go to the run of the different weapon because you switched. A, switching layers does support blending. I would recommend having like a layer that's the copy pose and swapping it with another blueprint that doesn't use that. Yeah, it sounds nice and clean. Yeah, it sounds like that would give a much smoother <laughs> blend result between our um, 
our normal lion and the um, not so normal lion. <laughs> Gotta make sure that transition is nice and smooth. To be fair, like blending between like this and then the quadruped version of the lion, it's probably not gonna look good in a linear blend. So you might want to transition <laughs> there. But I think switching layers. Is <laughs> you really cool though. You don't see a lot of characters. Just look great. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I can't think of any examples actually, just off the top of my head. Huh? Yeah, me neither. But. Uh... Yeah, based on what Jose recommended there, I think it's totally doable. You could have a your lion running around quadrupedally and occasionally taking a potion and going bipedal and copying, you know, retargeting animation. Somebody should do it. Whoever's in the chat, ask that. Do it and send it to us. We'll have a laugh. Yeah. I will share it with everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you'll make my day. I will. <laughs> I will personally send you an Unreal Engine t-shirt if you can do that. There you go. That is my promise to you, chat. Whoever can make this happen. The next question that we've got is from Mega Steakman. Um, I've noticed that when you use the control rig setup phase, it always uses the preview mesh in the control rig asset rather than your current mesh during runtime. Um, any fixes that you would recommend for that? Um, I was only recently made aware of this issue. I'm not, I'm not aware of any fixes at the moment, um, except to say that we're aware of it and we're on it. Awesome. There we go. This is what I mean. They're always, they're always in here. They know, they know the bugs inside and out. They're ready for them. <laughs> the next question we have is from Vassal Nan. I'm so sorry if I'm not saying that correctly. How to set the root bone of the new retargeted animations to be dynamic and not static when we retarget from animation with a skeleton of a different hierarchy? Um. So if you want to re if you want to copy the root motion over when you're retargeting, you can create a chain for just the root bone, and uh, so set it the root bone as the start and the end of the chain. And then in the chain settings in the retargeter, you can set the translation mode from its normal retargeted translation, where it tries to kind of figure out the proportional um, size difference, and you can just basically ignore that and set it to absolute mode, where it'll just copy the actual position and rotation of the source onto the target. So you treat it like any other chain, like it's an arm or a leg. You just create a chain out of the root and, and set the translation mode to absolute. Awesome. Making sure I'm going through and finding the, the last few questions here that I can squeeze in in our last five minutes. Um, so next question is from Jan R, and they were wondering if you could explain how the foot locking works. They're guessing it's connected to the IK rig somehow, but it's actually not. But I think Jose would know more about that than me, maybe. Uh, sure. So there is two versions of foot locking. Like one is experimental, and uh, uh, is going to be experimental in, in five one. That's a foot placement node that allows you to like lock the feet and position until the, the foot actually leaves the ground and it will keep your foot placement clean. But there's also a, an IK rig a foot locking solution that is a, a, that you work on current. I, I don't know the details of that one, but you're using a similar, a similar method. But that one's for like for ground alignment. Yeah, for ground alignment. Oh right, yeah. Um, trying to get the, get it straight in my head. All the different ground alignment solutions we have floating around in our demos. I th I'm pretty sure it, it's using control rigs. So. Um, oh no, that, that, that's not what I, I mean. I, I, I so sorry, sorry. The, the ground alignment. That, that that's not what I meant. I when you're retargeting the sprite from one character to another, uh, I believe you 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 did some work so that the the feet wouldn't slide. Oh. From, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So in in five O, the retargeter doesn't really account for a, 
adjustments in stride. I mean, it, it does, but it, you have no control over it. It will just kind of do its best to give you a stride that's appropriate for the size of the character you're copying onto. Um, in 5.1, there is a feature then to actually control that. So um, it works in concert with adjustments that you can make to the root motion. For example, if you have a character that's walking, playing an animation where they're walking, say, 10 feet forward, you can squish the root motion down by a half so they walk only five feet and then squish the stride down by a proportional amount as well so that they take small steps um, and only go half as far. Or vice versa, you can make them take larger steps and go you know, 15 feet instead of 10. But that's only 5.1, so you're going to have to wait. Yeah. And for 5.1 too, this foot locking solution is also going to have ground alignment built into it, so you're not necessarily going to need to use a control rig. It's just going to be another tool for you to use. Yes, and that thing looks fantastic. It's uh... It really helps lock feet down and get rid of that terrible sliding that we all hate so much. You guys are doing a great job of getting me even more hype for 5.1 than I already was, which I thought was impossible. But <laughs> next, we've just got a couple left. So next we have, again, from Andrew W., in the post-process animation blueprints, what are the pose drivers used for? Uh, that, that's our solution that I hinted at for doing the secondary deformations on the mannequins. Um, mm. So, yeah, it, it, you can either use pose drivers or control rig or a combination thereof, but essentially what a pose driver does is take an incoming pose and then compare it to a target pose that the author has, has recognized as being problematic. And as the incoming pose gets closer to that problem pose, it starts blending in effects. Um, the pose driver, frankly, has a, a workflow that uh, requires you to go outside of Unreal and, and can be a little laborious. So I, re I tend to recommend people and push them towards Control Rig for their secondary deformations. Awesome. Well, that also actually kind of answered the next question as well. So thank you both so, so much for taking the time today to show us all of this really cool and fun stuff and show off some of these cool tools that maybe not everybody knows about or was using. And hopefully it'll help make some of their processes faster and easier and they can appreciate just a margin of the incredible hard work that was also put into Libra. I know it's, <laughs> it was an insane amount of effort on everyone's part. So I want to also thank both of you so much for all the work that you've done with that as well. And I want to give both of you the chance as well, if you have anything else that you would like to say to chat before we wrap up. Uh, we just hope that you enjoy Lyra. Uh, sure, I, I have one. Uh, like, uh, when I didn't, uh, when I was in the game jam in 2014, I didn't get the T-shirt shipped because it got locked, uh, like across the border or whatever. I never got the T-shirts. Is, is there a way I can get my my, my game jam T-shirt now? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? A ship has sailed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I had to it try. That's why I had to come to the live stream. Yeah. <laughs> we'll um probably what I'll do, I'll print out a individual T-shirt just for you, since <laughs> since you. Yeah, that sounds get excellent. It. Uh, that, and we will fulfill perfect. this yeah. stream for you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. This, this, this... Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you. Very but much. yeah, once Everybody again. Is. <laughs> thank yeah, you both so Thanks much this was such a fun yeah this was such a fun show i really really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us and our community and show them a lot of the cool stuff that we get to do as well as thank you everybody who came and watched the show wouldn't be what it is without you and your interaction and seeing all of you laugh right along with me <laughs> was also such a joy so thank you for being part of this stream with us 
Um, we post all of our streams in video format that can be viewed on demand on both our YouTube and Twitch channel, Unreal Engine. So if you missed any part of today's show or you want to go back and rewatch, don't worry. You can always check it out afterwards there. Also, don't forget to keep up with us at Unreal Engine on all social media, as well as come say hi on our forums where you can get the latest news and also find all of the links associated with today's stream. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you all so much. And I will see all of you next week, hopefully as well. But with that, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.